University of Edinburgh and today I'll be chairing and also offering some provocations after each paper. Hopefully we're going to have a, a really good well-rounded discussions around this theme of social justice, social justice in relation to the Attainment Challenge project. So I think I'm going to introduce the first speakers, first of all, and that is Archie Graham from the School of Education, University of Aberdeen. And um, I think the title of the paper, I hope it hasn't changed, is Exploring Student and Beginning Teachers' Enactment of the Concept of Pupil Differences in Schools Located in High Poverty Environments. So Archie will be speaking for about 15 minutes and then I will respond to you. Thank you very much, Laura. Okay, welcome to uh, this University of Aberdeen presentation, Exploring Student and Beginner Teachers' Enactment of the Concept of Pupil Differences in Schools Located in High Poverty Environments. In Scotland, the Scottish Teacher Education Committee's National Framework for Inclusion 2014 and the Scottish Government's 2015 Scottish Attainment Challenge are two examples of current policy initiatives that underpin the promotion of inclusive education. Such policies are reinforced by the Quality Act 2010, which places a legal obligation in schools to make reasonable adjustments to provision where required and prohibits discrimination and harassment based on protected characteristics. Ensuring individuals are treated fairly and equally, no matter the race, gender, age, disability, religion, or sexual orientation is paramount to understanding these protected characteristics. In many countries, including Scotland, it's a professional expectation that teachers will recognise and respond appropriately to diversity and learner differences. For example, the new 2021 GTCS standards for both provisional and full registration set out the mandatory requirements for student and probationer teachers. These standards require student and probationer teachers to promote equality and diversity, paying careful attention to the needs of learners from diverse groups and in upholding children's rights. That's the GTCS 2021, page five. While such professional standards can and do provide a framework for supporting the professional learning and development of new teachers, it's less clear how student and probationer teachers interpret and respond to diversity and pupil learning differences in their various practice settings, including those that are undertaken in high poverty school environments. Our aim in this presentation is to explore the lived experiences of student and probationer teachers in relation to how they make sense of pupil differences in a learning to enact inclusive pedagogy in high poverty school environments. A theoretical background. So according to Florian and Black Hawkins 2011, inclusive pedagogy is concerned with achieving positive educational outcomes for all learners. Underpinned by commitment to addressing learner differences without marginalizing or stigmatizing learners, Inclusive pedagogy is recognized in the literature as being underpinned by three assumptions. One, difference between learners should be expected in any conceptualization of learning. Two, teachers must believe they're capable of teaching all learners. And three, teachers will develop creative and new ways of working with others. In this presentation, we wish to highlight the assumption that engagement with inclusive pedagogy promotes understanding of differences between learners as characteristic of what it means to be human and something to be expected in all classrooms. However, as Florian and Black Hawkins 2011 state, it's not enough to simply know that the learners in the class are from different backgrounds. To enact an inclusive pedagogy, teachers also need to address learner differences without marginalizing or stigmatizing learners. In the following slides, we report on data gathered from final MA, Initial Teacher Education Student Teachers, and from probationer teachers undertaking their practicum and induction year respectively in high poverty school environments to explore how they make sense of the concept of pupil differences in their classroom settings. For the student teachers, data was collected via questionnaires and semi-structured interviews, and we produced two case studies. The reason for the small sample was the COVID-19 pandemic, which seriously impacted on the number of student teachers able to participate in this part of the study. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, data were collected from probationer teachers via classroom observations, reflective diaries and semi-structured interviews to produce seven case studies. The student teachers were recruited from the MA4 Initial Teacher Education Programme and carried out their practicum in primary school settings. The probationer teachers were graduates of the same PGDE IT programme, Four of the probationer teachers were placed in two primary schools and three were placed in the same secondary school. 
All the research participants were familiar with inclusive pedagogy and were aiming to enact an edu educational inclusion. The data relating to the lived experiences were written up as case studies, and we had the questionnaire data. Each participant is served as their own case in terms of data collection to elicit detailed descriptions of their lived experiences. We then interrogated the data for the, uh, from the student teacher questionnaire and conducted a cross case analysis to identify any replicating patterns in terms of eliciting a better understanding of the context the probationer teachers were working and how they made sense of pupil different backgrounds and learning differences while intending to enact inclusive pedagogy. Two key themes emerged from our analysis. One was developing awareness of differences of individuals, diversity, and the second was responding to learner differences. Our findings provide concrete examples of how the participants made sense of pupil differences while learning to enact inclusive pedagogy in high poverty school environments. We highlight five key findings in this presentation. I'll just visit each one in turn. So first, uh, pupil differences were recognised by most participants as a feature of all classrooms, and awareness was further developed by fostering positive relationships with pupils through discussions with pupils either as individuals or during class activities. Some illustrative quotations included. I made an effort to get to know each child personally and to find out about their lives outside of school in order to help build a trusting relationship with them. I was a student teacher. There was a range of ethnicities and cultures in the class. This was often discussed by exploring in different countries and Google Maps, zooming in to see where individuals were from. And during specific holidays, we explored cuisine and celebrations from around the world. I was a student teacher. And I've taught them for a year now, so I know what they're capable of and I know what they struggle with. So trying to work around that and give them help and scaffolding, that was one of our probationer teachers. The second finding, uh, when difference was mentioned, it was seen largely in terms of equality and diversity in relation to protected characteristics and cultural diversity. However, some participants highlight challenges when trying to recognize differences in individuals uh, within their classroom setting. In terms of equality and diversity in relation to protected characteristics, including cultural diversity, illustrative examples included. The class consisted of diverse ethnic and national backgrounds and genders. In terms of sexual orientation, multiple students spoke about the possibility of identifying with an LGBTQ plus label as a student teacher. And my supporter teacher was very informative about the children's backgrounds and would give me an insight into their home lives. I was able to notice such diversities such as race and class through the image of the children. It's another student teacher. And in a school at school C, not every child will go to university. Some might want to, some might not because their parents have never been. So it's a bit of a cultural thing. That was one of our probationers. In terms of challenges highlighted when trying to recognize differences in individuals uh, within their classroom setting, the following examples are provided by way of illustration. Diversity is sometimes harder to spot when everyone is dressed the same and speaks the same brand of English, meaning you have to dig a little deeper to get an insight into people's diversity, especially as children get older and just want to confirm. That's one of the student teachers. And some differences are not visible to the naked eye was another student teacher. A further challenge was noted by the participants whereby they stressed the need to demonstrate sensitivity when addressing issues surrounding diversity as illustrated by the following quote. It's difficult to drill down too hard into differences between pupils' backgrounds, classes, etc., because often pupils are very aware that their home life may be different in a way that affects them neg negatively. This can be very stressful for students. I try to recognize diversity and difference in these areas without linking it directly to the students, as I feel this is unethical and we'd put them in the spot or other them. That was one of our student teachers. In our third finding, we found no examples uh, of participants using their understanding of pupils' diversity to inform planning to address learner differences. Our fourth finding, pupil learning differences appear to be based on the understanding that pupils in the classroom had a range of abilities. So for example, there's a wide range of abilities and interests, that's one student teacher, a large attainment and motivation gap by choosing seating randomly, the groups were mixed ability, who were often that led to an off-balance during group work for both learning experience and engagement. That's another student teacher. I found maths particularly difficult as the variation of level and learners was vast and many learners require one-on-one -on -one support in order to fully internalize a concept. That's another student teacher. I would have broken up my time more uh, between like the floor ability ones to help them along because I think that they all need to be involved. And if it means that I have to go and help them a little bit more, 
then I think that's okay, as long as I'm telling the slightly higher ability ones what I want. That was a probationer teacher. And another probationer teacher stated, I seat them four around a pod. So four is quite good because they can work in pairs, they can work in four, and then they can work by themselves. So it gives me a good level of differentiation between them. And our fifth finding, dominant school cultures normalize grouping by prior attainment or setting based on ability to respond to learner differences in relation to the teaching of maths and English language in primary schools and setting in some secondary school subjects. However, in wider curricular areas, participants group the learners by mixed abilities. In terms of the dominant school cultures, illustrative examples included the school preferred ability groupings from numeracy and literacy, the range of ability between one group from the end of first level and another group working towards the end of second level meant it was difficult to know how to create a lesson which would encompass all the learning needs in a way which was not ability grouped. As a student teacher, uh, they were grouped by ability, the whole class never did a maths lesson together. As another student teacher. The way we do it in school C is we set them. So like all the kids in that class were like the same ability level. So it makes it easier for us to plan one lesson rather than five or six. So they all got around about the same adjust score. That was a secondary probationer teacher. And this class that you observe got more handouts because they're the lower ability class. So they're 1.7, which is like a middle set. Whereas my other class, uh, my other first year class was a 1.4, which is the top set. So the top set, the class got a little bit more work, like writing, you know, a little bit more thinking, whereas these guys got more handouts. And that was another uh, probationer teacher in secondary. In contrast, there was more flexibility in other curricular areas. For example, in subjects such as health and well-being or science or topic, children work together in mixed ability groups. They would discuss questions, solve puzzles, create posters and different activities as a student teacher. Lessons which were planned for the whole class using mixed ability groups incorporated a variety of activities in order to make them accessible to all pupils. That was a student teacher. And so today's lesson in terms of inclusion, the idea of the lesson is that they're working in teams. So the teams have been decided through some randomization and some ability matching. So this way, some of the lower ability pupils will match with some of the higher ability pupils and therefore they'll be able to help each other. And that was a probationer teacher. So getting to know learners and getting to know what they need to know about learners that is relevant to teaching and learning is complex and integral to the enactment of inclusive pedagogy. It underpins the pupil-teacher relationships and supports teachers, including student and probationer teachers, to plan meaningful learning opportunities for all learners. In the case of the participants in this study, it was evident that they were developing awareness of differences between the learners in their classroom settings in terms of protected characteristics, socioeconomic backgrounds and cultural diversity. Supporting student and probationer teachers to know the school context and to foster positive relationships with the children and young people in their care is a key feature of initial teacher education and the induction year. Building and fostering positive relationships in the learning community, which is respectful of individuals, is also integral to the student and probationer teachers meeting the standards for provisional and full GTCS registration. Yet for the participants in this study, they did not appear to make use of this developing awareness to inform their pedagogical approaches to learning differences or educational inclusion. For the participants in this study, pupil differences were experienced as two disparate, disconnected ideas, developing awareness of differences of individuals, diversity, and responding to learner differences. The participants were aware of the need to recognize difference and made efforts to get to know the children and young people as individuals, generally being positive about those differences and respecting them. However, as highlighted earlier in the presentation, it's not enough for teachers to simply know that the learners in their class are from different backgrounds. The findings of the study suggest that perhaps more needs to be done to help student and probationer teachers to make sense of and to operationalize the concept of pupil differences in classroom settings. To this end, it would be beneficial to develop a shared evidence-informed understanding within initial teacher education of how knowledge of pupils different backgrounds can support the enactment of inclusive pedagogy to address issues such as those highlighted in the Scottish Attainment Challenge without marginalising or stigmatising learners. For example, questions such as what aspects of understanding pupil differences can be tapped to support educational inclusion of all learners and are possible for student and probationer teachers to enact in their classroom settings. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Archie. OK, I'll provide a couple of um points just uh, from your presentation. Meantime, if people would like to just enter comments or questions in the chat, I think Nicola will mo monitor the chat so that we give a, an opportunity for everyone to, to offer reviews. 
So, um, first of all, um, as I was listening to to your paper, Archie, I was uh, I was just happy to hear actually you talking about difference. And I thought, if I imagine for a moment that this whole attainment challenge venture was a, a xylophone, I thought, and then attainment was this ladder of progression from a lower to a higher tone. Then when we come to the word difference, I, I thought clearly we are on one of the faulty bars. It's uh, that word that seems to undermine the whole project of linear and seamless progression to some kind of goal. So I was thinking about Biesta's tripartite, education as qualification, education as socialization, and education as subjectification. From what you said, it seems that our student teachers are well versed in the first and second dimension. They understand different uh, diverse diversity. They understanding as they understanding it as an uh, heterogeneous mix of backgrounds, languages, abilities. They also prepare themselves to be the facilitators of a learning environment that might include differentiation of tasks or content, perhaps. They also might adopt appropriate inclusive practices that are targeted for particular individuals. I wonder if they see their job mainly as that of aiding different pupils through to qualifications to gain access to curriculum. They also see themselves as those that build relationships with each and individual pupil so that they aid again socialization and being part of a community, acquiring the customs and behavior of, of, of a community. But it is the third element in the tripartite that has that purpose that seems to me missing and less investigated because that is linked to our student teachers becoming subjects of their own teaching. So I wonder here if through a harder questioning of poor purpose, we can ask similarly harder questions about what we seek to achieve with our educational endeavors that we can question what is at stake in our educational happenings. As we know, education doesn't work in relation to only one purpose, but a number of domains. So I wonder whether this is the trouble with the whole business of attainment, according to which purpose it is conceptualized. Does it reduce the educational work of our student teachers to the delivery of a task? And if we want to move away from the utilitarian dimension, then what shape should beginning teachers' education take? What is it that should we be attending to? How do we allow them to encounter that otherness, that difference that seems to come beyond their normal sense-making practices? It seems to lie beyond their normal understanding and they certainly don't encounter that opportunity in schools given what you said about the structures that are in place. So I do wonder, how do we move towards a teacher education practice that addresses them, our student teachers personally, that speaks to them and also asks something from them? So we're not simply asking why is teaching important or why is education important, but we are asking that more calling questions, probing question of why is it in education important to me? Why does it make a difference? to me. And I just wonder what the audience think and what other ideas are out there. We can give a bit of time. Silence doesn't sit well with online presentations, so therefore we are going to break the rule of thinking time and we are going to move on to Stephen Day and perhaps Stephen you're giving us a bit more to mull over. So Stephen is going to uh, talk about another very hot issue in, uh, in the current educational sphere and it is the dataification of education. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, 
what I want to do is I want to talk about datafication in education with a, a, with a, a, an eye to looking at how we use data in an ethical way for social justice within the system. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and set this within an educational policy context, and I'm going to try and traumatize datafication in education. Then I'll draw on some of the, the research that we've done what, it is, what does it suggest? And then try and ask some critical questions for policy and practice. So it's fair to suggest that education, like many social systems, has increasingly become information driven, where educational institutions, such as schools, universities, colleges, and those that work in them and learn in them are continuously generating and using data for a variety of purposes. Now, to that end, when we look at education in terms of schooling, the Education Scotland Act in 2016 put the National Improvement Framework for Education in Scotland on a statutory footing. But in practical terms, what that actually means is that it's underpinned by four priorities. And those priorities are framed around about the ideas of one, improving attainment, in particular in literacy and numeracy, about closing the attainment gap between the most and least disadvantaged. It's also about improving the health and well-being of all pupils, which seems a bit spurious. Why was that thrown in there? And then it's about improving employability skills and sustained positive school leaver destinations for all young children. Now, in order to help the, uh, the delivery of the National Improvement Framework, the the NIF has got six drivers. Now, the first three, I would argue, are very general. We have known for a long time that school leadership, teacher professionalism, and engaging with parents is the key to success in education. However, the next three drivers are all related to the, the gathering of, of data uh, that looks at assessment of pupils' progress, school improvement, and performance in the information, which is all based around about um, teacher, every department, every school gathers information about the progress of their children that they are working with, and then they use that information to support the outcomes that they're looking for. In terms of school improvement, every school has the responsibility to evaluate how well they're doing against the national improvement priorities and other performance measures. And the, these are evaluated by themselves, by the local authorities, by the inspectorate. And the improvement in terms of performance information is all about the, the, the way they gather, they analyze data, and how they then use that to set targets for improvement and to show where success or you know, there is a need for more work to be done. All of these things together is what drives the National Improvement Framework at a policy level. But in terms of social justice, we have to set social justice and datification within what teachers are expected to do. So if we think about the General Teaching Council for Scotland standards, all of the standards, provisional registration, full um, um, registration, career on professional learning, middle leadership and headship, these require pre-service and in-service commitment to the professional values of social justice, trust, respect, and integrity. And that these lie at the heart of the relationships, the thinking, and the professional practice within schools in Scotland. Now, if we think about that, that therefore means that teachers need to be aware of and be careful that their analysis and interpretation of the data that they gather as part of their everyday practice, which coincidentally they're expected to base their profession. They need to be cognizant of the potential biases as well as the ramifications and implications of their actions for the educational outcomes of their pupils. So when we think about that, we have to ask ourselves some questions around about how do we problematize datafication? Well, we've already suggested that every day a large quantity of educationally relevant data is collected, a variety of means 
and also for a range of different purposes. So if we argue the point that we are, we're gathering this data, then these data should be then used to have an influence on all manner of educational decisions that range from the micro to the micro level of the system. Now, increasingly data is being gathered that focuses on the individual, the class, the department or the school, and that data tells a story or a, data, a, a story about the, the self. So the data self or the data doppelganger has become a, a, a feature in some of the educational research that I've been looking at. So there's also this argument that's been put forward by Baradotti, where she talks about the idea of all technologies can be said to have a strong biopolitical effect upon the embodied subject they intersect with, where data and the use of data has become part of who we are. This slide here points towards a move towards post-human existence, where the data not only influences how we think and act, but leads to new kinds of ways of being in which humans think and talk through data. So this runs the risk of losing sight of the purpose or purposes of education, where if we think about it, what that does is it brings an accountability and control system that positions teachers and other educators and their learners in a variety of ways, depending on the motives and the prerogatives of the individuals interpreting that data. Often data is interpreted based on the problematic assumption of linearity in terms of teaching and learning that reduces and objectifies both teaching and learning from the complex, non-linear and highly messy processes that they are to a simplistic objective form. So, how these data are analysed, interpreted and used across all levels of the system is often problematic when decisions are made or based on such assumptions, which we can argue are questionable. So what we would argue is that the effective and efficient alignment of classroom practices with special, specified learning objectives is objectified to the point where the lifeblood of the learning process is the data that's gathered by the teacher as they pursue their everyday task, rather than looking at what is the task, the richness, the interaction, the relationships, the softer skills. So when we frame data in this manner, organizational effectiveness is often understood as a function of how strategically an educational establishment, such as a school, a local authority, or for that matter, a government department, consistently uses the data that they generate in and around their core tasks, which for schools, it's teaching and learning, to inform ongoing decisions in the pursuit of quality outcomes for the learners. Now, it's, it's to this directive that datafication holds sway. So, what does the UWS research suggest? Well, like I said in the, the first seminar, in terms of student teachers' attitude, in all student teachers that we looked at, we looked at all uh, at PGD primary, PGD secondary, and BA for undergraduate primary education students, we found that context dependency was correlated highly with self-efficacy, and that enjoyment of data tasks was low, and that impacted on the effective state domain towards the attitude to using data. But we also found that PGD primary and BA4 primary education students were more anxious when, than PGD secondary students when it comes to analysing, interpreting and reporting classroom level data to parents and senior leaders. Now, the data itself, I'm not going to go over this data already, but I just wanted to show you that we can see shifts in the attitude profiles across all eight of the, the different um, dimensions of the scale. And I would like to suggest that this data clearly shows that context dependency with ed educational interventions and that the intention to use data 
stays roughly similar, except for in the BA4s, where they start to see it's much more important. And we would suggest that there's perhaps there's a cultural thing that's going on with our BA4s, where they're actually not really, truly engaging with summative assessment data in much the same way that you would expect the secondary or the, the, the PGDE primary to. Now, in terms of students, uh, teachers' ability to use and interpret and make meaning from data, in all of our student groups, there was a significant minority of students that struggle to make basic inferences from classroom level data, and they struggle to make meaning from that data and to draw inferences about practice from that data. Now, it's not all doom and gloom. Despite that, we also found that there was a high level of agreement in all three student cohorts that it's important that they use data to inform pedagogical practice. So if they see that it's important, but they struggle to do it, then the obvious question is, what do we need to do to support them to get better at doing that? And at what point do we actually start thinking about this as a, 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 an element of their work? But still, a significant minority of our student groups struggled with basic concepts, which relates more to statistical literacy than anything else. They didn't really understand what standard deviation meant. A significant minority couldn't identify the poorest or the highest attaining people in the class. What was also interesting was that the PGDE cohort, um, for the secondary cohort, the there's a majority of students that could not make meaningful inferences from the, the, the data that looked at school level to comparator level across Scotland, or to look at attainment versus SIND data, which is really quite disturbing, especially given the fact that 65% of the, the, the secondary cohort have a STEM background, which is alarming on a number of levels as a science educator. Now, the, the actual thing that we gave them to look at was looking at tracking and monitoring data. And this table basically shows that there's very little difference between the PGDE secondary and primary cohorts in terms of their ability, but actually the BA4s were markedly poorer at analyzing that data. Uh, and we've done semi-structured interviews now with BA4s, PGDE primary and PGDE secondary to try and drill down to find more information about that. And, and that will be in the final report. So, using data with an eye to social justice and agency, we need to think a little bit about how most students, regardless of their program or their epistemological background, struggle to make meaningful suggestions with regards to alterations to their practice in terms of improving their differentiation. How do they increase their level of challenge? How are they identifying pupils that are struggling educationally, but also socially and emotionally? How do they bring all these contextual pieces of information together to more holistically understand what's going on in a classroom? And this suggests that their ability to use data in a socially just way might be impeded because if they can't look at it in the whole, when they start to look at differences that emerge based on their, their contextual understanding of the class, then if they can't analyze the data holistically and then look at it in a stratified way, then we've got some problems. But what was more encouraging was that over half the students in all three student cohorts wanted to know more information. And the kind of information they were looking for was background context, attendance, the rate of um, uh, you know, additional support needs in the class. They recognized that there was basic limitations with the assessment data that was presented to them. And they could see that this data was just a snapshot in terms of attainment, which was informative to a point that had its limits. Now, all of this leads us to ask some critical questions for policy and practice. So in terms of meeting the demands of the National Improvement Framework, we need to ask ourselves some questions. In what way can schools be supported to be make better use of the full range of evidence and information that's available to them to improve people's outcomes? And this revolves around about issues around about data access and infrastructure. Second question is, in what way can teacher education support teachers, both pre-service and in-service teachers, to make more effective use of the range of data that's available to them to drive their practices while not losing sight of the many purposes of education? So this is around about an issue to do with education and training. 
particularly um, continuing professional development for in-service teachers. Third question is to, to what extent can we support these um, in-service teachers and pre-service teachers to make better ethical use of data in their everyday practice? And this revolves around about partnership and collaborative working. My, my, my main concern has always been that I would love to have worked with probationary teachers, but I was systematically excluded by our partners because they didn't want us to engage with their probationers for whatever reason. And then the fourth question is, what role do the existing partnership arrangements have to play in facilitating professional dialogue around the best way to increase the systematic use of data by teachers to improve educational outcomes? And for me, this really revolves around about the notions of, of command control and power within the education system, because the, the extent to which um, the partnerships are working, I would argue, is, is a little bit patchy across Scotland. And that's my presentation, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'll offer some comments to you as well. It gives people time to, to comment as well. Okay, so as I was listening to your paper, the question that came to mind really was, what is in a number? Which, of course, leads to the other question as to why are we so obsessed with numbers? And where does this obsession come from? I mean, I don't want to trivialize this problem in any way, but the more I was thinking about this evidence business, um, the more the image of trying to squeeze my waterproof Mac in this little handy pocket can, came to mind. And it also works with the metaphor with the sleeping bag, I think. We seem to be chasing an idea of numbers as objective and objectified truth. But numbers, as you said, and also as Davis 2007 reminded us, are in fact a form of inscription that is a form of mark making, a bit like drawing. We inscribe portions of reality which really are inherent, inherently dependent on the perspective of the inscriber. Is it really a question of boundary setting? So through the use of numbers, we can slice the reality and skim it of those components that cannot be easily inscribed. And most importantly, numbers can be powerful tools for justification. So again, as you said, Stephen, numbers are part of a much wider dialogue around the purposes of education. And I'm really not sure that the language of learning and the way that the NIF proposes can provide the direction of change that we are looking for. It seems to me, just to paraphrase T. Eliot, that we are using yesterday's language to grapple with tomorrow's problems. And these problems go beyond learning. They address disenchantment, affective disenchantment, disenchantment. They call for new imaginations. They call for different and diverse creativities. So my questions really to both speakers at this point and to the audience is how far do we engage our student teachers in the articulation and disarticulation of educational agendas? How do we enable them to dig much deeper into what something should be learned for? And also, can we go beyond this instrumental use of evidence to justify the agendas that are already given to us? Can we really ask, does it matter what we understand by evidence? And what are the implications? What does it matter to whom? And finally, what other possibilities actually may lie beyond an idea of education as evidence gathering? I agree. I think part of the problem is the way that the political classes that are in charge of education, how they view what data actually is. For me, data is a much more encompassing thing than numbers. It's, a, it's, a, it's about the, you know, how does data then become evidence? How is it transformed? How do we think about interpretation? And how, how do we avoid the, 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 the stripping out of context from, from this? And this is part of the problem I find with the national framework's drive towards the gathering of much more focused systematic data. 
And when I, when I talk in terms of data, I'm really talking about information, evidence, in a more holistic way. I don't think the infrastructure in Scottish education is sufficiently uh, there to be able to cope with the complexity of the data, however it's uh, contrived, that we would need to be able to engage with in order to make the kinds of changes that the government wants. But equally, part of the, the issue that I have, and it's, it's always been something at the back of my mind where it, you know we need to avoid politicians using education to socially engineer what is essentially a sociological and eco, eco, economic problem that is a policy issue beyond education. And that's, I think, where the National Improvement Framework really falls down. Because actually, if it's avowed that the child is at the centre, then the child cannot be a data um, generator. And we've lost at sight at the, at the policy level of the child. And what, what is essentially the purpose of education? It's not about the generation of numbers or the, the, the simplification of an input-output model. It's much more complex than that. And that's where the problem with accountability comes in, because I think that's a political decision about how, how do we apportion resource? And in some cases, if you look at what the press are doing with leak tables, blame, and how they value or don't value certain aspects of education, that becomes problematic for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a comment from Morag. The challenges with interpretation of data and then working with what it tells you as a teacher are set with an infrastructure that does not give data power to teachers. I don't know whether Morag you'd like to elaborate on that. Do you mean that teachers at the end of the day don't have the power to act on the data that they themselves have gathered? Or do you mean that they have to gather data on on issues that are perhaps are not at the centre of their concerns? I suppose a bit of both, Laura. I, mm. I think that um, particularly new teachers, um, and we see this a bit, I think, in initial teacher education with student teachers, don't necessarily have access to what is seen by the school as data, um, and that limits some of their actions. Uh, but I also think all of that is is about a, a lack of, of knowledge and ownership of the data because of the way it's set within the policy structure, as Stephen was describing. Uh, and as he was a sort of further point, since I have the microphone at the moment, as Stephen was talking just now about the limitations, I was thinking about the points Archie was making and you made following Archie's talk. And this is a tangent, but one of the major issues identified in the review of additional support for learning last year was that it's actually that the guidance and the legislation is fine, but it's not owned by the system because it's divided into a series of data sets um, and, and labels for want of a better description. Um, and I think that's a similar problem within our education system. It's about the way the policy sets things up and it's about the power structures within um, within the way that, that data is collected. Um, and I suppose I would then could then follow through and argue that that's then what affects the ability of of our new teachers, as Archie was was working with, uh, to discover things and then make related changes in their pedagogy or their, their other practices. You could even say that perhaps that this purpose of data gathering can close it down even further, the ability of a student teacher to see that difference. Yes, I think so. And I think we saw that in the UHI project that was linked to to where we were working with student teachers and looking at the the data and well all the information they were using when they were making judgments about their pupils and how how best to work with them and how to plan and part of their challenge was and that was across our partnership area 
partnership being another issue here, uh, the north and west of Scotland, was that this, the new teachers, the teachers in their induction year, didn't have access to all the information they needed. But then in small schools, some of them had access to too much information at times. So uh, it's challenging. Yeah. I see here Nicola pointing to data tensions, which would be interesting to know exactly what you mean, whether it's tensions of purposes, which seems to be coming out quite strongly, like we collect data in order to address issues of social justice and we create even more issues of injustice as we do so. Yeah. Uh, it seems rather contradictory and rather frightening. Yeah, um, I think... Yeah. yeah look, I, think, I think the point that Stephen made about that, the, the tension of the child at the centre, yet the data is not, the, the child can't be a generator of data and it's, you know, it's a person, it's a human being, it's not a statistic and a number. And I think that that's that often gets forgotten in the system. And with some of the work that we've done working with teachers to, to encourage them to look at their context and gather data and information about their context, they've done it with numbered statistical data and then they're finding it difficult to because that's the focus that that come that that, that, that is on but then that it's not picking up the nuances in the classroom when they're actually looking at the young people so these young people could be performing really well in examinations but in the classroom they're disengaged and they're mm -hmm. not seeing that until they're not the data the, the numerical data doesn't show them that but it's actually looking and the data of engaging with the the children and really looking at the context tells them that and then they start to ask big questions about what, why am I, you know, these children are coasting, I'm not, they're not challenged, they're not motivated, they're not engaged, but the statistical data says something different. Um, no. And I think that's really important and to see teachers realise that and it, it's, it's that kind of light bulb moment of this is, hang on, this is, we thought it's one thing, but this is actually something different and we have to address this. And when they've got the time to really look and gather the kind of data that that um, Stephen's talking about as well. That's when they see it. That's when they are, when we understand much more what's happening in our context and our classrooms. Yeah, so that leads very nicely to Paul. Certainty versus uncertainty. Shall we open up and really see what's happening? Because it could be a bit bit more, a bit wilder than we think. And action versus activity. Paul, do you mind if I call you in on action? <laughs> you got yeah, some disruptive fine. examples. Yeah, <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you, Archie and, and Stephen, for a really interesting presentation. Thank you. Um, it, it's stuff I've been thinking about a great deal, and, and those of those of you that know me will know my work in in policy or the aspects of policy and things. And it, it strikes me that what what we have is a, a a real drive for certainty in education is to kind of really nail everything down as much as we can so that we can you know objectively say that is a good teacher we can objectively say that is a good student we can objectively objectively say that's a good school and we have a sense of certainty in the system and and, uh, and with that there's a, a drive to kind of remove anything that, that gets in the way of that and actually life's life's a bloody mess to be honest with you isn't it I mean life just gets in the way of everything to be honest with you and the more that you try and nail stuff down that the worse it actually gets it's like it's like trying to herd cats really at the end of the day and what and what troubles me about things like the NIF are, are a the assumptions that underpin it i.e if you're a disadvantaged student you're not going to do very well but let's face it that's the kind of assumption underpinning that at the end of the day well there's no certainty there any stretch of the imagination the certainty that comes from, well, that school's doing really well, so they must be doing something correctly. Well, well, yeah, what they are doing is getting a load of middle class kids in whose parents can afford to pay for tutors. And as I keep on saying, I love league tables because they tell me where to go to buy secondhand clothes from charity shops and I'll get all the best smutter from them because those shops are in the well to do areas. And if you look at the data from schools, you can say, the data from that school is really good. Therefore, that's got a good catch because we still operate catchment areas in Scotland. And I'm grateful for that. You know, that's a good catchment. Therefore, I'll get better smutter when I go to the, my father-in-law calls it smutter. So we have this drive for, for certainty in a sense. And, and what we then do is we then look at activity. So we look, we, we look at what teachers overtly do. Uh, and what we will do, and we do this when we judge them in ITE, you know, we'll go out and, and we'll sit in a classroom and 
whenever I go out and see teach student teachers or any teacher, I try not to just sit there. I try and actually engage with the class and engage with the teacher and become a kind of second pair of hands, as it were. So I just get bored sat at the back of the room, to be perfectly honest with you. Shh, don't tell anybody. I shouldn't really do that, I suppose. Um, and actually, what we then do is we watch the activity that goes on. And what activity is, is activity is that which is centred outside of ourselves, that which is centred predominantly on, on achieving something with others or for others. Now, at one level, that's fine. But on another level, when it doesn't actually touch the inside, when it doesn't alter who we are or make us question who we are and what we're about, i.e. action, that is. And Spinoza writes about this in, in some degree, although from a kind of uh, more religious context, I guess. Unless we actually look at action and we look at that which changes ourselves in relation to that which we're trying to do with others, then all we ever do is go through the formula. And, and so I, I, I see on, on Twitter loads of young teachers from thankfully not from Scotland, saying, well, this teaching lock's dead easy. You stand at the front, you tell them what you want them to know, you, get, you ask them some targeted questions, no hands up, we're not allowed that, we have to target questions, cold calling they call it. And then we get them to do some work, they tell us what they've done, we recap the learning outcomes, jobs are good and we're sorted. Okay, now that might work in one particular lesson, but, but that level is extremely problematic, I think. And, and what was really interesting listening to Archie's work, and have to forgive me, Archie, my father rang me with a really important phone call to say that I must pick his strimmer up tomorrow from Argus, so I missed a bit of your presentation. But it, I, from what I, can, I, I could hear it, what actually these, these students were, were, were doing, essentially, was this kind of oscillation between certainty and uncertainty. Certainty on the one hand of knowing what the students needed, what they were about, what, they, what their strengths and weaknesses are, but kind of the uncertainty of, well, what the hell do I do with this? Actually, where do I go with this? And actually, I don't think there's a problem in saying, I don't know. You know, because from that, you then get collegiality, you get collaboration. Because if we just simply do that, I've got the answer, all we do is we start saying to that person, you've got the answer, you tell me, or you tell them, and we're back into the old style of CPD that we used to have with the cascade method, experts coming out, telling us what to do, you know, three-part lesson, and VAK, and multiple intelligences, and all that jazz. So embrace uncertainty and embrace action. Forget about activity as the primacy, and forget about certainty, because we're not actually going to get anywhere if we go down that particular line. And for me, the problem with politicians is they're so caught up with wanting certainty because it gets them re-elected in five years' time. Well, they think it gets them re-elected. You know, there's my rant anyway. Thank you, Paul. Nicola, am I right that we have one minute left? Yes, unfortunately, yes, yes Laura. Um, <laughs> Great, really interesting presentations and, and great conversations. So I don't know if you want to have one last comment to, to round it up or... Uh, just to say thank you, Paul, to, to pick up on so many uh, areas. I think it was a, a, a good summing up. And we had a final quotation from Donald, which is really a change in the way of seeing means a change in what is seen. Um, I guess we can be philosophical about it and hoping that we, we have a way of or changing it from within, maybe harnessing the power of evidence I, I, from I, within. I would agree, and, and, and <laughs> wasn't it Einstein who said, the, the, you know, the definition of madness is doing the same thing 50 times and expecting a different result every time you do it, you know, and, and, and oh, you know, is that what we've got? You know, keep on doing this and they'll, you know, keep on doing literacy and they'll finally learn to read. Will they? You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll have to close. It was a, a small comment from David Watt, well, let's give it give it just a little bit of space, David. Uh, just just in case we don't quite understand what you are saying, are you are you questioning uh, the amount of evidence that's available? And then we close for real. <laughs> yeah, I think if we are looking to address and uh, promote and achieve social justice, then we don't really have the data sets to do that. The information isn't shared in a way that we promote it. And just in general, in terms of the policy angle, uh, nationally, uh, the amount of data has been reduced. So engagement in international surveys or national surveys around literacy um, have, have been uh, taken out of the system. So at a policy level, they don't have sufficient uh, information and data in order to promote a social justice agenda. 
Thank you, David. And that's a really significant comment if we think about um, the dataification of education being passed on to teachers. So I'm going to be left with this question as to whether or not the job of the teacher is changing and is becoming the job of the administrators who are clearly not, not doing the job. Anyway, that would be a, <laughs> an unsettling thought, uh, but one to consider. It's uh, everything for me, uh, so I should call uh, this meeting to, to an end. Uh, thank you, Sira, for hosting 